here. Welcome. Uh, my name is Brad Wilcox, I'm in sociology here at the University of Virginia. In recent years, as probably many of you know, a great deal of ink has been spilled over the increasingly unequal character of American life, both when it comes to opportunity and outcome for ordinary Americans across the nation. But I think most of this ink has been devoted to exploring the ways in which economic forces structural forces are dividing Americans along class lines. Comparatively little attention is focused on the ways in which changes in the American family may also be fueling today's class divide. Yet given that marriage is strong and stable among the middle class and increasingly fragile among the poor and the working class, it's quite possible that one reason our society is increasingly unequal, both when it comes to opportunities and outcomes, is that family trends now diverge by class. In other words, what does inequality really have to do with the fact that families are strong and stable in Belmont and comparatively weak and chaotic in Fishtown? Tonight, with the Reeves the Brooklyn Institution, we'll take up this question as lecture, Are Dream Hoarders Just Good Parents? Inequality, Opportunity, and Family Structure. We'll also address the more specific question of how much the children of the upper middle class is educational and enough success can be attributed to their parents' devotion to stable marriage and highly invested parenting. And our guest this evening is a senior fellow at the Brooklyn Institution, as well as the director of their Center for Children and Families. He is a noted family scholar and public intellectual who speaks and writes in a wide range of venues, from the Aspen Institute to New York Times op-ed pages. We finally say that this lecture is co-sponsored by the National Marriage Project and Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture, both here at the University of Virginia. Please join me in welcoming Richard Reeves Thank you, Brad. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak. Can everyone hear me okay? I'm going to try and do it like this rather than with a mic. Yes? Can you hear me okay? Um, so uh, this is the question that Brad particularly wanted me to address, but I'm going to briefly talk about the book Dream Hoarders, uh, which kind of led, I think, to this lecture in the first place, and then situate the question of family stability, family structure within that um, broad um, broad argument. How long do I speak for, Brad? How long do I have to? I may even do it in less. Let's see. Uh, but I will invite your questions. And also, if, if as I'm going along, there's something you don't understand or disagree, then let me know. The first thing I should say is it should be obvious to you that I'm not from around here. And that that's the story of my journey from my homeland, the UK, to my new home, the US, is part of the story of class and the different ways in which class inequality works in those two different countries. I should say that I am now a US citizen as of last October. Uh, I am a US citizen as well as a UK citizen. In fact, I became a citizen in Maryland, the state where I live, on the very last day that you had to become a citizen in order to register to vote. And all 53 of the people from 47 different countries that became Americans or US citizens on that day all went to vote. So last year I managed to vote in, actually not last year anymore, the year before, I managed to vote in both the US presidential election and the Brexit referendum on the EU. So for me, it was a banner year politically, not making a partisan point, just not the outcomes I was personally hoping for. Um, and I, part of the reason for, for my book about class and inequality, and in fact, the motivation for my work on intergenerational mobility, has been a strong moral conviction, and I will state it as bluntly as that, that a fair society is one in which we don't know too much about where someone will end up based on where they started. That intergenerationally, we'd want to see a fair amount of fluidity and movement between the different rungs of the ladder. I spent a lot of time in the UK, in and out of government, and think tanks working on that, and that's what I now work on mostly at the Brookings Institution. And of course, in the UK, we're sort of known for our class system. We're obsessed with class. It's a saturated with class consciousness. Every interaction, involves an exhausting attempt to figure out precisely where you sit on the pecking <coughs> order based on how you talk, what you wear, what sorts of sports you play, where you went to school, how you cut your cheese, which fork you pick up, etc. It's this constant sense of class saturation, which is appropriate enough in a society where our head of state is still hereditary. Something which is fun for Americans watching The Crown or being excited about Meghan Markle. Less fun, perhaps, for those who are subjects of Her Majesty the Queen. 
we still have hereditary members of our upper house. The House of Lords, one of our two main legislative bodies, still contains hereditary members, people who are there literally because of the fortune of their birth. We have a nobility, an aristocracy. We have all kinds of things which are, are inherited. So we're known for that. Contrast the US, my new home, the classless society, the society where actually in order to become a US citizen, I had to sign a document where I signed away all my noble and hereditary titles from elsewhere. In my case, it was a somewhat short list. I'm <laughs> sad. But the point holds that actually you do have to give up hereditary. Because the idea of something that's hereditary, passed on, as a result, dint of birth, is un-American. Has been from the beginning. Now, I'm not going to claim for a moment that the American, the American experiment has always lived up to that ideal. I'm simply saying that was the ideal. Contrast a structured class-based society like the UK. I have now come to believe that the US has a class system that reproduces itself as ruthlessly, efficiently as the British one I left behind. But it does so under a veneer of classlessness. It does so camouflaged by the myth of meritocracy. And it does so in a way the winners of this society are convinced they've won fair and square, that they've won as a result of their hard work and their brains. And that actually <coughs> coarsens the political culture. And as I wrote in a Times piece, I wrote a Times piece last summer called Stop Pretending You're Not Rich. And as I put in there, at least in the UK, the posh people have the decency to feel guilty. At least some of the time. And I actually never thought that I would think that was a good thing. I wanted to run away from the snobbery and inverse snobbery of the UK. But one thing that is good about that is that there is a kind of recognition that there are certain factors structural otherwise, which have led to your position. It is not all the result of your own diligence and your own brilliance that you've ended up where you are. It's a very comforting thought to think that, because then you can justify all your winnings and your status. But to the extent that it's not true, it makes it more difficult, I think, to bring about some of the changes that we want to politically. So I talk about the fact that when I grew up, my mother, who was left high school at 17, from rural North Wales, both my parents were upwardly mobile, grew up in a, I grew up in a working class town north of London. She was so terrified that we wouldn't make it up the British class ladder that she made us learn how to do ballroom dancing. So for a miserable year of my adolescence, I spent every Saturday morning learning how to waltz, cha-cha. Not that I say learning how to, attempting to learn to. My mother denied this, but it's true. I have the certificates to prove it. Waltz level one, samba level one, etc. And it speaks to a kind of obsession and a worry about class, which, as I say, the UK is known for. And then finally, I'm going to tell a story uh, about US politics. And then I'm going to lead into the specific question that Brad and others have asked me to address, which is about family structure. Is there a clicker? Or just use this? Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of young people in the audience. So just in case, this is uh, Barack Obama, uh, former president of the United States. Feels like a long time ago, doesn't it? Feels like a really long time ago. And he had a, something of a U-turn in January of 2015. He's flying on Air Force One, actually, where he was flying from. Uh, this is a story based on real events, as I say, in Hollywood Bay. He was flying from uh, India to Saudi Arabia. And while he was on the plane, uh, he had the policy decision to make. Nancy Pelosi in California had received a call from this man, Chris Van Hollen, then congressman for my district in Maryland, now junior senator from Maryland, Chris Van Hollen called Nancy Pelosi and said, we have to do something about this idea of the president. So the president had just put forward an idea as part of his budget to change a certain element of the tax code. And Van Hollen and Pelosi were so angered by this, and their constituents were so angered by it, that they started lobbying the president to change his mind. So Pelosi says, I'm on Air Force One. I'll just pop down the corridor and see the president. The president's in his office on Air Force One. He gets a knock at the door. Come in. Who is it? It's Nancy. Hi, Nancy. How are you? What do you want? You've got to kill this tax idea. I wasn't there. I'm paraphrasing. Don't sue me. I'll think about it. I'll consult with my advisors. Go back. Call the White House the next day. The plan's killed. Uh, because it's, quotes, a distraction, to use that great catch-all political phrase. It's a distraction. And what you can see up there what it was, it was a reform to 529 college savings plans. Hands up who knows what a 529 college savings plan is. Really? Well, OK. 
Okay. So most people knew, but interesting that none of us. Are you all students here? Okay. I wonder if your parents know. <laughs> okay. Uh, 529 college savings plans were uh, introduced by George Bush, and what they do is they allow you to save into uh, a savings fund, which can only be used for uh, college costs, but it grows free of capital gains tax. It's also exempt from the gift taxes, so you can front load it. The Obamas put in a quarter of a million in one year to their own daughters, 529s. In many states, there's also an income tax deduction. So where I, where I live in Maryland, we can put $10,000 a year into it and save about $500 off our Maryland income tax. It's a tax-advantaged college savings plan. What could be wrong with that? Why did Clinton veto it the year before Bush passed it? Because the only people who will benefit from a tax uh, a capital gains tax-free uh, savings fund are people who have the money to save and put it away and who will be eligible for capital gains tax anyway. Turns out almost all those people are from the top of the distribution. So this chart just briefly shows you how many people in the different income quartiles, so the poorest quarter of the population on the left to the richest quarter of the population on the right, and the right-hand scale tells you, the left-hand scale, the dark blue, the ones on the left, is like how many people in that income quartile have a 529 account, and then of those who have one, what's the average balance in that 529 account? Now, this shouldn't be surprising, given that having the discretionary income to save and it being rational to try and avoid capital gains taxes is something that's going to worry the people at the top of the distribution. But nonetheless, what Obama did uh, was, uh, advised by some of his colleagues, was to say, that's a stupid way for us to spend money. A couple of billion a year, uh, because we're just giving money to the upper middle class for their college savings accounts. There's no evidence that it increases their savings, it just makes it cheaper to do so. To try to introduce a tax credit system, which would have been more progressive and would have used the, the money more effectively. All hell breaks loose in the liberal upper middle class districts of California, Maryland, etc., at the idea that we're going to have our 529 tax benefits taken away. And the reason for that is one of the reasons I ended up writing this book. Because it, it like a light bulb going off, showed me that the American upper middle class, who I define as the top 20% of the distribution, people who now have household incomes of above, say, $135,000 a year, average of that group, about $200,000 a year, are A, the ones who are doing relatively well as a result of recent e economic trends, and B, quite unaware of that to the extent that when you try and do something progressive like take away one of the most regressive elements of the tax code on sound policy principles, all hell breaks loose. <coughs> Obama had to retreat. Those of you who follow politics will know that 529 plans are back in the news again because they're now available for use not only for post-secondary education but for private K-12 education as well. So if there is anybody in this room who has kids at a private K-12 school and you're not using a 529, get a different accountant. In many states, including New York, you only have to leave the money in the 529 account for five days to get a tax deduction against New York income tax, take it straight out and use it. It's horrible, it's inefficient, it's regressive, but by God, you can't take it off us. And so for me, it was a moment of just sort of seeing where the real class fracture is, seeing Obama do that. The other motivation, and the final one really for the book, was my growing frustration at the rhetoric of the we are the 99%. As if the problem of inequality in the US could be drilled down to just the top 1%, the people who now are in households with well north of $400,000 a year household income, probably 440 now, something like that this year. They're the ones who are the problem. We are the 99%, those of us who might fall into the upper middle class but aren't quite in that top 1%. And so there's a whole class of Americans, professional, healthy six-figure incomes, who have been able to convince themselves that they are the losers compared to the people at the top and that they shouldn't have to give anything up or pay more tax and that that has become deeply corrosive to the political culture of this society. And that inequality isn't always about somebody else. So I'm going to briefly go through some economic numbers, and then I'm, going to, then I'm going to turn to the question that I've been asked to address. So this is very briefly the argument of the book in a nutshell, in case you don't want to read it. Although now you can listen to it as well. It's an audio book. I had to audition for the part of myself. But I got, I got, the, gig, I got the gig, so that was nice. 
This is my argument that the upper middle class, this top 20%, are separating from the rest. That's the inequality that we should be most focused on, not the top 1%. That, that inequality isn't just point in time, but it's across generations, that it's perpetuated in a way that's indicative of a class system, not just an unequal society, but a stratified society. And that happens through two kind of mechanisms. Mechanism one is through what I call market meritocracy and education, which is crudely put the fact that the children of the upper middle class are so well equipped by the time they hit the labor market, it's no wonder they do so well. So the labor market mostly in that case is acting meritoriously. It is rewarding the kids with the education, the credentials, and the skills. Those are disproportionately from the upper middle class because of everything that's happened in the first 25 years of their life. So that's what you like as a kind of meritocratic way of ensuring intergenerational transmission of status. Doesn't mean it's unproblematic, as I'll come on to. And that's where the role of family structure and family stability and parenting will come in. And I'm going to say quite a lot about that. And then the second mechanism is what I call opportunity hoarding, or rather Charles Tilley, the famous sociologist in his book Enduring Inequality, and I've repurposed it, um, but it was his term originally, which is actually where we're not, we're not only sending our kids out better equipped to win, we're actually rigging the game in their favour. We're finding a way to hoard opportunities for ourselves and our kids in a way that are exclusionary of other people, not just doing the best for our kids, but in the process, hurting the chances of other kids. And I'm going to give a few examples of that. And then my final point will be that we have to solve this problem where so many affluent Americans have been able to convince themselves that they're not rich, that they're not part of the problem. And along the way, I'll do a deep dive into the family. So first of all, I'm going to just very quickly have a go at this we are 99% issue. Um, I can update the figures slightly now, but I haven't for this chart, and the, num the patterns are the same. So this, to be fair, is a we are the 99% chart. This shows you what's happened to the real household income of these different groups. So the top 1% at the top, the 19% below them, the line below that, the 40% below them, and the 40% below them. These are the income trends. Now, if you look at a chart like this, well, we are the 99%. Assume for the sake of argument you're in that upper middle class but not in that top 1%. Look, we're all in the same boat. While those people at the top gallop away. Two problems. One, there's a lot of movement in and out of that top 1%. It's not a fixed group. Secondly, I've done what social scientists always want to do to trick you. Look at my left-hand axis. Social scientists do their dirty work in two places. Well, maybe three. The left-hand axis, the footnotes, and the choice of deflator. In this case, it's the left-hand axis that's doing a lot of work. Because to get the 1%, I've got to go up to, look, look what I've had to go up to. Stretch the top axis, not to say it's not true, but it creates a very vivid impression. So let's take the top 1% out altogether. Now what I'm showing you is the income trend for the bottom 40% at the bottom, the next 40%, and then the 19% above them without the top 1% in at all. So that number is not being artificially pulled up in any way. The 1% are excluded from my calculation here. It's not as sexy a chart, for obvious reasons. Look what I had to do to the left-hand axis. Okay. So I do, I do at least start my axes at zero, which not all social scientists do. Just always check that as well. I would say that this is an inequality that is every bit as important as the one I just showed you before because there's a whole lot more people in there and because it will overlap with other inequalities in education, neighbourhood, schools, and family. So we'll come on to. But the broader point here is that the bottom 80% of the US income distribution looks pretty much the same today as it did in 1980. There has been no increase in income inequality in the bottom 80%. No. You do a, do a standard inequality measure, Gini coefficient or something, the bottom 80% is the same. It's above that line where the action is, for all kinds of reasons. Um, so if someone says there's a growing gap between rich and poor, that's incorrect. There's a growing gap between the rich, defined here as the upper middle class and above, and everybody else who's seen pretty flat real income growth over the last few decades. So I, that, for me, is an aspect of the inequality story that's not told often enough. And if you were cynical, it would be because, you might say it's because pretty much everybody studying inequality is in that 19%. They're very worried about poverty, but they're really angry about how rich their friends from college are, especially the ones that went to Wall Street. But it's not just money, it's all these other things too. I think that inequality is becoming multidimensional. Both affluence and poverty 
are, over, are clustering together with other good things in life in a way that makes it more likely to endure. Education, health, wealth, life expectancy, and, and so on. And family structure and stability, which I'm going to come on to. I'm going to say a little bit about the uh, inequality across generations. I won't spend too much time on this. Simply to kind of point out that there is quite a bit of mobility between the poorest and the richest. This shows you which uh, quintile now. For some reason, economists use quintiles. Education people use quartiles. If someone could figure that out for me, that would be great. But anyway, the left here is showing that if you're born poor, you're more likely to stay towards the bottom. This is the most mobility you're going to see in any chart. But all the attention tends to focus at the bottom, the poor. Here, I'm just focusing at the top. But there's at least as much perpetuation of affluence as there is of poverty. I'm going to say a couple of words about education, as we are at an education institution, then go to family, which is my main topic. The idea of education, particularly in America, is that, to use Horace Mann's quote, it's the great equaliser. And that's sort of true, and also wholly untrue. The first bit, it is the great equaliser, how education can equalise people's life chances. And here on this chart, I'm just showing you, these are kind of people who are, all of the people on this chart are born into the bottom 20% of the distribution, broadly poor. That's roughly where the federal poverty is. So everyone on this chart is born poor, and then I'm just telling you where do they end up, if they, depending on their education level. So the blue is if you're born poor and you don't finish high school, red, you at least finish high school and green, you get a four-year college degree. And what you can see is, even if you're, bo if you're born poor and you get a four-year college degree, you've you got a very good chance of ending up in a much better place on the income distribution. So education, and particularly the possession of a four-year college degree, loosens the connection between the income of your parents and your income as an adult more powerfully than anything else you can see in the literature. So that's the good news is that education, and especially college education, is a massive upward mobility engine. The bad news is that almost no poor kids get it. This is a chart from the, uh, Equ the Equality of Opportunity Project run by Raj Chetty now out of Stanford. This has simply changed the field of intergenerational mobility research um, and f has strong findings on family structures we'll get into. But this one is showing you the parents' income rank across here, poorest to the richest parents, and then where the kids are going up that left-hand axis, which is their percent, the chances of attending college. That one does start at 20, no. Um, the percentage of the kids who are attending college at ages 18 to 21. So it misses mature students, but in those critical three years, what are your odds of being in college based on your parents' income? You know how sometimes social scientists put up a bunch of dots, and then they put a line of best fit through it, they put a regression line through it, and you're looking at it and you go, really? Mm -hmm. You don't need a line of best fit with this, do you? It's quite an extraordinary uh, correlation when you think about it, given that we like to think that college is the great equaliser. I know with a degree of extraordinary empirical precision the chances of a kid going to college based on their parents' incomes. If you want to see the US class system in institutions, look at post-secondary institution. In Europe and the UK, maybe a bit more in secondary school, but the sorting by class background and into class future in the US takes place in those years 18 to 25. That's really where the rubber hits the road for the US class system. And one reason why, don't you dare touch my 529. Because it is incredibly important to me my kids get into the best college possible. And by the way, I will do almost anything to get them in and pay almost anything once they're in. And guess what? Colleges have noticed. The market's not really clear in where you'd expect it to because we're all willing to pay so much. Now, I don't want to lay all the blame on colleges here because this is looking at SAT scores, and I have to do this by income bands. I can't do in thousands. I can't do it by quintiles or quartiles because of the way that the um, college board collect their data. But this is... What are the SAT scores in reading, math, and writing by the income of their parents? Right. So the colleges, in some senses, are acting meritocratically. They're using meritocratic measures, like SAT scores, to decide who to let in. The result is obvious. The chart you saw before is, in large part, in large part, although not entirely, the result of this chart. So it happens earlier. Why? Well, one of the reasons is because of what happens in families. I'm going to spend more time on this as a result of Brad's invitation before I close. So Brad's already kind of set this up um, quite well, which is this uh, truth 
that one of the most important class divisions in the US, and more important, I think, in the US and other countries, is in the stability and structure and nature of families in the US. So there's a very big class divide there, which I'm going to illustrate in a moment. And in fact, as my book has been criticized, I think the best criticism I've had from the right, the so social conservative right, I would say, this is um, good criticism, is that basically what I do is I identify a group of people who are doing everything right in terms of parenting, marriage, education, work, etc., and try to make them feel bad about that. It's the best criticism I've received from that point. And it's good because it hurts because there's some truth to the criticism. And so I've been writing more recently, I've written a piece on national affairs about culture, and I want to talk a bit about this, this here. Because it is true that whether liberals don't like this bit of the argument, that family stability and marriage patterns play an important part of the story. So I'm going to sort of show that a little bit using a few charts. Um, now this is by education rather than by income. Um, it's a common sort of chart that you'll see. This is you tend to use women because it just it gives you a more stable data point. This is women who are 40 to 45, who are trying to have prime marriage age, who are trying to take out cohort effects. This is people are marrying later now, so you don't want that to mess up the data. Look at it over time since the late 60s and do it by education. Bachelors, associates, high school. Now, the story here is of an overall downward trend in marriage rates or in the rate of being married at that critical age over time. So there's a quote retreat from marriage to the literature. But it's a very, very uneven one by educational background. And actually, the marriage rates among the top line, the kind of women with bachelor's degrees, have been flat since the mid-80s. And if anything, it might be ticking slightly upwards, or being married. And the being married thing is a result of two things. One, getting married, and the rates there among college graduates are pretty similar to their parents' generation, this is my reading of the literature. And the divorce rates, if anything, are coming down slightly. There'll be people in the audience that know that better than me, among that group. So you think slightly less exit from marriage too. So I think it's true to say that against almost all the expectations of scholars in the 1970s, marriage is flourishing among the American upper middle class. And there is a growing marriage gap and family formation gap along class lines. Now this is women, of course, <laughs> the other thing that's happening is they're marrying men who are college educated too. It's a stunningly unromantic term, a source to me. It means marrying someone of a similar background to you. And it's happening more. And because of the massive rise in the number of women who now have college graduate education, they are marrying disproportionately men who have college graduate education. And that means double the earning power, double the time, etc. There are huge differences, by the way, by race. It is much harder for a black woman with a college degree to marry uh, a man with a college degree because of black male college graduation rates and rates of marriage across racial lines than it is for a white woman. So these are the averages, but it disguises some big racial categories. So marriage first. Why does that matter? Well, this is a chart showing uh, the percentage of parents who stay together if they're together at the birth of their child by the child's age, by whether or not they were cohabiting or married. So 100% for both to start with, they're together, one, one set are cohabiting, the other set are married. What are their chances of still being together when the child is five, when the child is 12? So as you can see, there's a very dramatic difference in the chances of parents still being together if they're married at the time of the child's birth compared to cohabiting. Why that's happening is a different question. I would lean very heavily on the argument that it's because they were intending to have the child together. And that you get married, then have the kid, and go forward. A lot of the cohabiting couples, even though they're together, maybe didn't plan to become parents. They became pregnant, decided to make a go of it. But deciding to make a go of it and you became accidentally pregnant with the person you didn't really want to marry is not a recipe for success. And so what you're seeing is much, much more family breakdown among those cohabiting parents. So that's why the marriage rates both reflect and I think reinforce why it's matter. I'm going to go through some of these quite quickly now. 
I'm having to change the left-hand scale um, because of the uh, different numbers. And also, full disclosure, I'm changing the age here because the other groups have been the other. Now I'm doing 25 to 35 for single parenthood because those are kind of prime years to look at kind of single parenthood. So I've changed the age range. I just want to put that on the table. And then I'm looking here at the same bottom 40 income distribution, middle 40 in the top 20. What you're seeing is there's been an increase in single parenthood among all those classes, all those income groups, but it's very, very much lower at the top. So the idea of sort of highly educated you know, women choosing to become single parents so on, yes, that's true and you can read about it in the Times, but it is not the story. It is not the story of America. Unintended pregnancies. I can't quite do my same income breaks here because the way the data is collected. So I've had to go bottom 40, then the next 30, and the top 30. I can't do top 20. Uh, and there's two different kinds of unwanted pregnancies. They're the ones that the mother will say, I didn't want a child at all, after they've had the child. Or the child was seriously missed time by at least two years off. Put them together and gives you an unintended pregnancy rate. And again, what you're seeing is really quite strong differences in rates of unintended and unwanted pregnancies by that income group, which feeds into cohabitation, which feeds into marriage rates. This is the cohabitation rate. The left-hand scale has changed again because the rates are much lower. But simply to make the point that cohabitation is much, much stronger at the bottom than at the top. And then lastly, this is based on my own work, there's a measure of parenting, which is a measure of engaged parenting. It's a class-based measure in the sense that upper-middle-class parents are cultivated concertedly cultivating their kids. If you want to know when this story changed, <coughs> I want to know when the, the noun parent became a verb. And I can tell you what, it was the upper middle class that verbed it. Now parenting and to parent, you used to just parent. My parents were just parent. They didn't parent. We parent. Um, but so it's a class-based measure of it. But nonetheless, what you kind of see, you use this measure, which is the home, the home scale of parenting, and then you look at the kind of percentages of weakest and strongest parents using that measure, bottom third, top third, by income background. And there is a very dramatic difference, at least on that measure, in the level of engagement. So you might wonder what's in that measure. Right? Who's, how can you tell me what makes a good parent? There are things like not hitting your kid and reading to them regularly. Those are the sorts of things that will score well on the good parenting front. So... Um, I'm going to follow the rest of the argument, but I simply wanted to put all that up there to mention that families themselves are human capital machines. And to the extent that we can do something to support family stability, which may have something to do with family structure, and I'm sure we'll get into this in a kind of Q&A, then those of us who are interested in intergenerational mobility need to be as interested in that as we are in things like access to college, income distribution, and so on. Institutions transmit advantage and disadvantage. And what's happening is that the, the institution of the upper middle class family is very effective at transmitting advantages and, trans and translating educational and economic advantages themselves into advantages for their kids. And by and large, not only is there nothing wrong with that, there's almost everything right with that. But the implications of it are that if you, as a result of the lottery of birth, end up in a family that doesn't have that level of developmental opportunity, the class gap grows wider. You might say, well, that's just the price. Fine. These people should just not get pregnant accidentally. They should be better parents, etc. But if you're interested in trying to improve outcomes for those kids who, after all, didn't choose their parents, then it seems to me that that is quite a strong rationale for various kinds of investment to help those kids who are less fortunate to catch up. So the last thing I'm just going to do is go through a little bit of the market meritocracy bit. Um, I just have to put this up. Because people forget Michael Young meant meritocracy as a warning. His book, when he invented the term, was a warning. He warned that a society that came to believe it was a meritocracy would exhibit the following features. Rising income inequality because the people at the top think they deserve their money. Growing despair and disillusion among the people at the bottom of the heap because it's really hard to lose in a society that's supposedly meritocratic. The only person you can blame is yourself. Thirdly, more, uh, more of a desire to mate with someone who you think is going to pass on valuable genetic material to your children and therefore succeed in the, in the meritocracy. And actually, fourth, growing anger among the people who feel like they're losing against the people who seem to be winning. I tell you, well, well worth reading again in light of current events. But just to finish, 
not to let ourselves completely off the hook here or feel too great about ourselves, great parents and savers that we are. There's a bit of opportunity hoarding going on, and I'll just say a tiny bit. One, maybe one or two charts. Things. First, exclusionary zoning. The way that American neighborhoods are zoned is a colossal problem for inequality in the US. Land is getting expensive. Space is running out. The frontier is closing around San Francisco, DC, even parts of Baltimore. Um, because we use local regulations to zone out people who aren't like us. By like us, I mean people who can afford a single family dwelling in their wealthy neighborhood. We then organize our school systems geographically so that we can ensure that even if we don't pay for our kids to go to school, we can get them, as I do, into a high quality public school, which is relatively well defended uh, against incursions by low income kids through local zoning. They have racist origins, but they're now used, being used as class. Um, classes are ways to prevent people getting in, and those of us on the right side of it do well. We have a mortgage interest deduction, thankfully somewhat reduced by the Republicans, which subsidizes my expensive house in my great neighborhood. I can then use local zoning regulations to make sure that only people who are as rich as me can live in my neighborhood, and so the cycle turns. And if we organize our schools in that way too, it's one of the reasons why I'm a big proponent of more school choice and charter schools, is it breaks up the geographical monopoly that we can create around schools. I'm not saying that some evil genius sat there and said, if I want a system that's going to really reproduce class, what I'll do is I'll massively subsidize housing through the mortgage interest deduction, then organize my schools geographically so people who live near good schools can buy their way in using housing, and then have local zoning to make sure that no one can ruin it. Not saying an evil genius did that, but, but if they did, it might look a bit like that. So none of us are doing anything wrong in any of those in particular instances but we are contributing to a system which is so far from being a free market that it's horrible. I wish there was something closer to a free market in housing in the US. It's a horrible, overregulated, distorted market which benefits me, but it's very bad for most other people. Um, and here are some charts. Housing's getting expensive compared to incomes. Why? This is an a innovative measure of land use regulation over time. A lot of that was built around racism. But nonetheless, we just like land use regulations in the US. We really do. And not especially around density. And it's a big, big problem. You take Los Angeles as an example. In 1960, we thought, we being the zoners, thought Los Angeles could hold 10 million people. That's the black line. When at the time, there were 2.5 million people living in it. Amazingly, now we think that Los Angeles can only hold 4.3 million people, which is exactly the number of people who live there. We were right in 1960. There's room for 10 million people in there. But the localities in Los Angeles have zoned themselves in such a way as to prevent the market working. Legacy admissions. Legacy preferences are one of those issues that I just discussed that um, people don't like talking about that, even liberals, especially in certain institutions. Maybe wrong about that, but I will say that the US is the only country in the world now that operates a hereditary principle in admissions to higher education institutions. It was wiped out everywhere else. It disappeared in the UK in the middle of the 20th century. Even our royal family don't get into Oxford and Cambridge. They're not good enough to get into Oxford and Cambridge. Um, I'm pretty sure if Americans, if you had a royal family, they would go into the institution of their choice. Um, and so here, though, it seems to be acceptable to have a, uh, a, a legacy preference, a hereditary principle at stake, which I think is unconscionable and, frankly, as a new American, embarrassing, and we should just get rid of it. Um, people say, well, it doesn't make much difference. Well, these are the legacy admissions rates at certain institutions versus the general admissions rate. Okay, the kids who are legacies are different. Maybe that explains the difference. Wish I could tell you. I can't. Why not? They won't give out the data despite the late Senator Kennedy's attempt to get them to do so. Why wouldn't they share the data? I don't know. Ask your admissions office. I think they won't share the data for one of two reasons. One, maybe it doesn't make that much difference by the time you control for everything else in the background of the kit. And they really don't want the alumni to, to know that. Because one of the reasons you get money out of people is saying, well, keep giving us money, help your kid get in. If that's not true, the money will dry up, and then where will we be with our endowments? Um, or it makes a huge difference, and we're letting in lots of kids who have no justifiable right being there, and that's embarrassing to any institution with meritocratic credentials. Either way, give us the data, and then I'll tell you whether these charts are telling the truth or not. 
And then lastly, internships, which have become a much more important part of the labour market. This is a survey of HR managers saying how important are they when you're hiring people. Internships have become very important. Uh, internships are not a trivial work experience type thing anymore. They are a fundamentally important part of the labour market and a transitional institution into the labour market, especially in certain professions. Half of them are unpaid. Many of them are handed out on a grace and favour basis or using personal networks. That is systematically discriminating against the people who either can't afford to do those internships or who don't have people who can pick up the phone on their behalf. Internships are opportunity hoarding every bit as legacy preferences are and exclusionary zone. How do we solve all this? Well, one of the problems we have is that I want to invest in better quality community colleges, more access to contraception, uh, paying a lot more to teachers who are working in the, the toughest K-12 schools, much more effective financial aid, etc. But I'm going to have to pay for that somehow. How am I going to pay for it? By taxing the upper middle class or taxing the rich. Everyone's in favour of taxing the rich, it turns out, but they never mean themselves. This is a slightly difficult chart to interpret, but basically what it's telling you is, depending on the income of the person you ask the question, they define rich as very different. So to someone who's on less than 30,000, anything to six figures is rich. To someone who's on six figures, you need half a million. Now, that's human nature. I'm not criticising it, but I'm trying to make us be more reflective about it. Because if we only ever look upwards, then we'll never make any progress. When I was writing this book, Bell Sawhill, my very near and dear colleague, said, you need to read more Richard Hofstadter. We all need to read more Richard Hofstadter now, especially his work on the paranoid style in American politics. Now, this is from his book on the Age of Reform, which preceded the Progressive Era. And here's what he had to say, is that the moral indignation of the age was no, by no means directed entirely against others. Whereas right now, the moral indignation of the age is always directed against others. It's, it's directed against welfare cheats, or immigrants, or the rich, or the bankers, or the government. <coughs> It's always directed against somebody else, isn't it? It was a great and critical measure directed inward. Contemporaries who spoke of it had an affair of the conscience, if I'm not mistaken. So if Hofstad is right, the progressive era was preceded by a set of cultural changes, which was somehow a kind of acknowledgement on the part of the doing well, aided no doubt by the campaigns of violence going on around the country, that actually was in their interest too to give up a little bit, to make some sacrifices, pay a bit more tax, and to support some public goods which can help other people. Directed inward, an affair of the conscience. Jerry Cohen, who's a philosopher who wrote a book called If You're an Egalitarian, How Come You're So Rich? It's a fabulous book, it's a great title. Who sort of made a journey from a kind of Marxist background to something very close to, I'd say, a Christian um, political philosophy. He said that we very often think that social justice is to be found in distant institutions um, and uh, faraway policymakers' hands, something like that. And he said, I've come to believe that social justice is found in the thick of everyday life. I love that phrase because it speaks to something about standing in the shoes where we are now. This is not to say we don't need policy changes and all investment, but it does mean we have to start from where we are, our own communities, our own schools, the zoning decisions around our own houses, the school integration policy that affects our own school, the internship policy of our own think tank, the uh, uh, legacy preferences policy of our own university start where we are, and maybe then we can be part of a cultural change that will help more people. And yes, if we think that family structure and family stability are important, we shouldn't be afraid to say so, when that's where the social science points to. And then we should then give every possible helping hand to those who want to do better for their kids to do so, to do so by having more stable jobs so that they can have more stable families by reducing their economic insecurity and providing more goods which will make it easier for them to be the parents that they aspire to be. But that will require us all to do something. And sometimes when we think about inequality, not always to look up at the super rich or down at the poor, but to look in the mirror and wonder whether we aren't part of the inequality problem too. And with that, I'll stop. <laughs> Questions? Questions, challenges? What, what most annoy you? <laughs> yeah. Just a uh, clarification. I, I, this is a terrific presentation. What, what's, um, what's the the big problem here, or are there two two big problems? And the two I could think of would would be at any given moment, you know, static analysis. You, you have a skew yeah. in uh, wealth and income, both, I guess. And the other is lack of mobility. Your yeah. your, your words. You, talk more about mobility, but no. 
So the hypothetical I would propose is if at any given moment you took a snapshot and you saw a skewed distribution, but the, you knew that there was lots of mobility, yes. lots of people were going down and up yeah. and down and up, right. would that be okay? Is that yes. what you're after? Yeah. Or are you after a more Swedish, you know, better Gini coefficient with where, where the mobility is a secondary yeah. okay. issue? It's a, great, it's a great question. There's a lot of scholarship on this question too. Um, what I'm after is more mobility, mm -hmm. more fluidity, and more of an open society, less of a strong correlation, fewer of those sharp strand correlations. And I, I am only interested in the skew at any moment in time to the extent that it influences that. Right? And the extent which influences that is a, is a product of two things. One, how big that gap is. It's just a certain point where the sh sheer scale of the economic gap. They do relate, yes. But it's almost, it's just very hard to stop it transmitting itself. But actually, I lean much harder on the other, on the second of those, which is that we should be aiming to ensure that in any given level of economic inequality, that it's harder for that to be transmitted across generations through various kinds of institutions. Um, and so I'm more interested, actually, in the fact that you get countries with quite similar levels of income inequality, but very different levels of mobility. And that's really kind of institutional thing. Institutions like right families, also K-12 education, post-secondary education, neighbourhood segregation, housing policy, etc. So in other words, the kids of the rich in other countries, like Canada or Australia, are more likely to end up rich themselves than other kids, but no, nowhere near as much as in the US. And that doesn't seem to be accounted for by the level of income inequality. It seems that money matters more in the US. Mm -hmm. You can buy more opportunity with money in the US for your kids. And so there's two ways to tackle that problem, if you think that's a problem, which I do. One is, get the money off people. And the other is, find ways to stop that money being so easily convertible into opportunity in a way in a way that's unfair to them. I think the second of those is a much more politically realistic prospect. The amount of redistribution that would be required to get to anything approaching a more egalitarian. I'm much more interested in trying to sort of stop, stop that money from being so convertible into opportunity. And so most of my proposals are along those lines. Because in the end, my moral foundation, and again, I'm honest about that, is much more about I'm offended by kids being stuck on the bottom and to some extent people being guaranteed a place at the top. Much more so than I am by gaps in rich and poor. It's not the gaps in rich and poor that bothers me, it's the fact that so few people are changed places mm -hmm. each generation. So would you, would you favor <coughs> taxing uh, expenditure on higher education by richer people? Taxing expenditure? Yeah. Like Not subsidizing it, but taxing it. Um, I think I'll just tax them more generally. I think one but of the problems... This is more related to your point about mobility. The yeah. education, in many ways, rich people can spend their money yeah. and spending it on the higher yeah. education of their yeah. children okay. is the one that is, yeah. uh, seems to be most in tune with what you were Okay, about. but there's, th let's say there are three states of being around that. One is, I'm subsidizing their spending on higher education, the current situation. The middle state is, I'm neutral. I'm neither subsidizing it nor penalizing it through taxation. And the third, which you're proposing, is why don't you penalise it a bit through taxation to reduce the, amount, the, the ability to convert it into that? Can we get to the middle first before we have that conversation? Um, because actually, uh, just stopping the subsidies would be great, and we can talk about the endowment tax in the Republican tax bill if people like. Um, we can talk about 529s and the kind of tax treatment of higher education institutions, which is hugely disproportionately good for the upper middle class. Let's stop subsidising it. Let's get the government out. <laughs> of that market and simplify the tax code at the same time. Do we then at some point in the future want to penalise it? Probably not. I mean, even countries like Sweden don't penalise people for sending their kids to private K-12 schools. Mm -hmm. That seems to me that that's a close to breaching an individual right to spend my money how I choose to. I wouldn't, however, give those K-12 schools a tax break. I wouldn't give them charitable status. They're profit-making enterprises. So. Let's stop subsidising, I think, would be my point, and then remain neutral on it. Uh, I think to go further starts to feel punitive. I hear where you're coming from, and I feel the temptation. <laughs> but part of the test of a good policy is knowing what you want to do and realising that it's totally inappropriate not to. Yeah, more questions? Especially from the back. Yes? I, I have a, a case study question here in Charlottesville. Uh, 
a little more than half of our public school students are eligible for free or reduced lunch. Uh, we mm -hmm. have a very good local public school system. Mm -hmm. uh, but because of the, the family factors, those kids arrive at different states when they begin mm -hmm. kindergarten. So uh, both my kids are in the public schools. The teachers and the institution of the school invest heavily in the kids who are disadvantaged, mm -hmm. as well they should. Mm -hmm. But it pulls apart such that our, our high school is known as Yale or Jail. <laughs> The kids from families like mine can achieve, and the kids who start out disadvantaged, even with people who are very, very much committed to their good and are trying to use the resources rightly, yeah. can't can't make up for the gap that was there in kindergarten. Sure. So I'm very curious to hear your policy analysis of how you address that in terms of inequality. So just to, to understand it, you're saying that your kids or the kids from more affluent or educated backgrounds are doing fine in those schools. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, with the exception of, I'm having meetings because attention's being directed to the kids who are misbehaving and taking all the attention, but apart from that. Yeah, so, uh, and you know, I'm, my, my situation is similar, and one of the things that happens is that even within a relatively mixed public high school, you will see those outcomes differ, which speaks to the background, the family, the edu learning experiences outside school. And I do think there's a bit of a tendency for policymakers to just have leaped, uh, put too much responsibility on the school system. Um, to solve a problem that actually lies only very slightly in the hands of the school system, uh, and which is unrealistic, is unrealistic to expect them to solve all our problems. However, I do think they can be part of the solution. What, what some people will say is that their kids suffer because of the attention that's going to the others. And I think that can happen a little bit, and that's why I have to be a bit careful. But also, the kids who are in more mixed schools, like mine or like yours, by the time, they benefit from having parents like us with pretty sharp elbows, um, who know the counsellors, who know the courts, who, you know, my wife knows all the best teachers in every single subject and she's on the phone to the counsellor to kind of make sure that our kid who is struggling in chemistry is kind of in there. So, right, it's baked in and nothing wrong with that either. Um, I think the, the, the only policy thing I would say, because it's not really my area of expertise, is there is supposed to be extra money available from the federal <coughs> government to support the poorer kids in those schools. But because of the way that we fund our public school system to get local taxation, that money actually just levels the playing field again. All it does is it means that the poor kids get roughly the same amount of money as the richer kids because <coughs> the tax base tends to be lower. Actually, if the, if the starting level, if we were starting at an even base, then that extra money, so the school you're talking about, would be getting extra money for the poor kids, which could be spent on the poorer kids. Um, and so there is a fundamental problem with the way K-12 uh, education is financed. And then lastly, I think that and the, the a new administration are carrying on with this the teacher incentive program is the, is the kernel of a policy which would actually provide much more by way of rewards to the teachers who are working most effectively with the poorest kids. And I don't know, I haven't updated this figure, but when, um, uh, when, he, when Arnie Duncan was Secretary of Education, he did a back of the envelope calculation that you could give every teacher teaching in the poorest 20% of schools a 50% pay rise for $10 billion a year. Um, now, I'm not saying... $10 billion is nothing, but the mortgage interest deduction costs us $70 billion a year. Um, so we could probably find the money if we really wanted to. Um, and I think that actually getting, the, getting more money into the hands of the good teachers who are willing to teach in the, in the more challenging schools would help. Allocating federal money to the poorer, to the poorer kids would help too. Um, but good on you, because one of the problems we have is that there aren't enough parents who are willing to put their kids into public schools, especially when they're more mixed, for fear that their kids will suffer, even though the evidence is that they won't, unless they're in a very troubled school. You can have quite a lot of poor kids in your kid's school before your kids will show any signs of suffering at all. Um, but there's a kind of myth about that, I think, that, that I think gets in the way of public education. So, thank you. So another big, kind of big question. Um, it, it's one thing to talk about policy changes. Uh, it's another to, to wonder why those policy changes haven't happened so far, and I, let me let me put it this way: yeah. you open with this ironic comparison between Britain and the United States, yeah. and you know, this is the land of opportunity that you just you just joined up with us. Yeah. You come from this class ridden, and yet I gather you're finding you, you say the United States has is, is actually less of a land of opportunity than yeah. even the UK. Yes, correct. So um, that's a puzzle. That's a bit kind of a macro puzzle. What's what's going on? And do you, mm. you know the, the Answering a question would involve years of study and lots of, but but you have this background that might help you speculate in, a, in, a, in an informed way. Well, I mean, what do you? So your your little anecdote about 
in the mid 20th century, British higher education um, abandoned legacy admission. Yeah. yeah. Is that is that telling us something? I mean, I, I think that's come almost impossible to pull off in this country. Well, almost impossible. Yeah. It's a nice little thought experiment, so I'll, I'll yeah. come to that at the end. But um, I mean, the first thing to say is it's not a fair comparison empirically. To compare a country of whatever it is, 60 million to one of 300 million, um, and with very different backgrounds, is kind of not fair. In the same way that comparing the US to Sweden or whatever, Denmark, crazy. Um, and what we know, again, from Chetty's work, is that there's huge geographical variation within the US mm -hmm. in terms of mobility. Uh, so we can't, we can't really generalize about the US in the way that I just did. <laughs> um, so we have to, because that's the data, but there is huge variation within the US and between different cities. So that's kind of point one. Nonetheless, the argument that the class perpetuation defined in this relative mobility way or stratification way or predictability way, like that chart on college going to is more effective in the US than elsewhere. Why is that? I think that skills and education play a very big part here. So to put it very crudely, I think cultural capital still counts for quite a lot in the UK. Ballroom dancing, how you talk. I'm not saying it doesn't count here, but here it seems to be more about, boy, you're smart and you went to a great college. And then you've got to present in the right way too, so sure. But it still seems more about human capital uh, than it is about cultural capital. And so the way that the US education system works is actually hugely important, and it works in a much more unequal way than most other countries. The US is very unusual in that the education gaps by class background don't narrow between K and 12. They may even slightly widen. Mm. So even when we've got the kids, <laughs> right, they're in school, the class gaps don't narrow. Almost everywhere else in the world, they narrow. Quite different amounts, but we can at least do something when they're in full-time education. <laughs> and then, boom, the college system kicks in. And the way that the US post-secondary system sorts people, I think, is a big, huge part of the problem. Um, then, to all, some of the other stuff we've, we've talked about. And I think that then, what's the resistance to sort of policy reforms, such as some of the ones I mentioned, let's use legacy preferences. I think it's because there is this real reluctance to let go of this idea of meritocracy. And I share that reluctance because it's a great ideal. I want to live in more of a fairer society. I'm using it now in a non young and negative sense. Um, uh, so I think that's one obstacle. People think, well, all fair. Uh, and until you get a cultural shift against that way of viewing the world, I think it's quite hard to make progress. So why did legacy preferences drop away in the UK? It wasn't the result of a change in law, because although our universities in the UK are you know, they're very different creatures, much more the pub they're much more public than here, they're still independent institutions. There's nothing to stop Oxford University tomorrow deciding how legacy preferences. And no one forced Oxford University to stop doing it. So why did they all stop doing it? They stopped doing it in post-war years because of a change in national mood and a sense of greater egalitarianism and a sense that it was just wrong. It was just unfair. <laughs> and that is not the sense that people have in the US about it. They don't think it's just wrong. They don't think it's unfair. And more importantly, there's a moral reasoning which goes on, which is, well, even if I think it's unfair, everyone's doing it. And to not use every tool at my disposal to get my kids the best chance I would make me a bad parent. And so even an institutional practice like legacy preferences, which we find individually, Troublesome. We engage in it on the grounds that everyone's doing it. But if you think about it for a moment, that's not a very good argument. If my kid comes home from school and says, I cheated on my math test today, but everyone did, it doesn't make it any better. And so I'm asking people to start putting pressure on their own institutions, their own lives, to try and change some of these things, because these are cultural changes, not policy changes. Policy changes might follow. But I'm a big believer now that policy changes follow cultural changes. And we do not lack for policy ideas. I've got a few in my book, but honestly, they're not very good. It's the weakest chapter in the book. And one of the most honest reviews said, this book is a moral argument thinly disguised as a policy pamphlet. Mm -hmm. It's published by Brookings, so I had to make it disguised as a policy pamphlet. But it's not, because our problem is not lack of good policy ideas from left or right that would break up some of these uh, opportunity hordes. The problem is not having a culture that thinks that they are not only okay, but actually sort of morally necessary. And that starts with us.
individually and, and institutionally. On legacy preferences, I would use the example of when the Ivy League gave up full athletic scholarships. Whether they actually gave them up or not. But anyway, there was a moment, I'm told there was a right. Okay. There's a reason why the Ivy League generally suck at most sports. Right? Kind of, but they did it together, apparently. So the, the history of this is that there was a kind of joint decision to say, okay, fine, we're all going to do it. Because they knew there'd be a first move of disadvantage. And I think it's the same with legacy preferences. And so I think we need to go door to door to door. And I think if we could get every Ivy League institution to say, if I could go to each of them and say, will you give it up if everyone else gives it up? Will you give it up if everyone else gives it up? Privately, no commitment. I think I might get it. I could be completely wrong about that. But privately, quite, quite often people are like, I'd rather not do it, but everyone's doing it. So let's say it's a collective action problem. So let's try and solve it collectively and see if we can't get everyone one Saturday morning to just come out and get rid of it. I'm trying, but you can start, you can help here. Yeah, Chris. So uh, I agree with pretty much everything you've said, although I, um, so, so the legacy preferences is, 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 is a good example. I mean, I, my diagnosis would be, my understanding, you can correct me if I'm wrong, legacy preferences are almost exclusively at private institutions particularly at elite private institutions. Um, and primarily, by the way, that means it's not, it's not the top 20%, yeah. all except for yeah. professors. It's the top 5% or 1%. Mm -hmm. but, but the question is, and so I agree with the yeah. approach of saying, OK, if we can kind of create <coughs> awareness, maybe try to create some moral outrage, we might make some progress. With that said, it's very hard for me to see in the system we're in, you know, this notion mm -hmm. that the Ivies are going to get together and say we're all going to get real legacy preferences. They have such strong individual incentives. I mean, yeah. as you say, Absolutely. that's one of the big reasons they get enormous amounts of money. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, I mean, I mean, what, what you're, it seems to me, to some degree you're saying, well, we can keep the system we have, but somehow with some moral outrage, some of these things will change. And, and they may to some degree, but mm. it seems limited to me. So I don't think, I don't think UVA gives legacy preferences, do they? No, we do. Yeah, and rather, rather, and rather, <laughs> and rather famously, donor preferences too. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, that's right. <laughs> and I, I don't agree with any of that, but you know. Yeah. Yes. Let's stay away from faculty preferences. <laughs> That's the really, really icky area in my view. Really don't want to go near that. Um, but look, it's a tip of the iceberg thing. My, my, I would say it's a top 5% problem, maybe a bit more than that. It's only 5 to 10. It doesn't, it, we're not talking about the bottom end of my top quintile. You're, you're right. This is more, a more of an elite issue. It's not just privates. It's quite a few publics as well. Um, but nonetheless, it is something that's more at the top. And you might say, look, it's relatively trivial. It's not like the kids who don't get in legacy are going to go, they're probably not going to go to like a community college. It's going to go to another institution that may be a little bit less awesome. It's not going to change my charts, is it? Um, so it might be trivial, might not affect why fight it. Well, my argument, and I won't say it any stronger than that because I'm completely wrong about it, is we have to start somewhere. And it's such an important symbol, it seems to me. Because if we grant hereditary privilege, in college admissions, we're not even pretending to make it meritocratic. You know, we've just given away something very important in that, I think. And so if I can start there, or to put it slightly differently, if I can't persuade people that operating a hereditary principle in college admissions is unfair, I've got no hope of persuading them anything else. Because I'm only getting started. Um, maybe we could say the endowment tax that's in the new tax bill would be reduced for colleges that got rid of legacy preferences. Right? If you're going to have a tax break on your colossal endowment, then maybe you shouldn't also get to let in kids who wouldn't otherwise get in because of a hereditary principle. So, so it might be instruments <coughs> you can start to use to sort of nudge things along. But then I want to do a lot more than that. Then I want to look at why is it that the number of poor kids going to our selective colleges has not gone up at all in the last 10 years. Pell Grant eligible a little bit, bottom 20%, not at all. The only sector that's seen more poor kids going to it in the last 10, 15 years is the for-profit sector, who's seen a market opportunity and are preying on it in a way that is very disturbing. It's a new subprime market in the, in the making. So, you, you know, I, I think everything you've said is right. And if there are strong arguments, well, fine. But I take the view that if I, if I come on, really? Only country in the world? 
That's right. Great. But one more question from Bob. Yep. Yeah, uh, uh, enjoy your talk. It's, it's thought provoking uh, in observation and then a question or two. Uh, the observation being is, is unintended effect, but sitting here with my tiger dad hat on, <laughs> I'm thinking like, yeah, boy, I'm really not going to be even more of a tiger dad to get my advantages for my kids. And I know that's not the message you want to get across. <laughs> I think that's how many people might react. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree with your the, the, the problem that you're identifying, mm -hmm. right? I, I'm not so sure about the solutions, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, solution part I agree with is yes. Why should we enfranchise rich people even more, give them even more opportunities? You didn't mention the death tax, you know, which mm -hmm. would be another example. Yeah. So called yeah. jack. Sure. Right? Or what I just did for my kids, I just gave them for Christmas last year their own Roth IRA accounts. Right. Right? Um, and, but, so I don't think we should be doing that. But I'm not so sure about your solution. So, one is, is you have this idea one of, once of meritocracy, but then of equal opportunity. And I think you're seeing a lot of sorting by merit yes. in the slides that you're doing. Sure. And, and you even talked about the, one of the warnings of meritocracy is that you're going to get more and more yeah. extremes. Yeah. And so you're kind of wanting equal opportunity, but you're afraid of meritocracy. And, and sure. so when you talk about that, I'm not okay. sure what you're, you're right. Well, that's, that I've been right. I, you're right. I haven't been very clear about that. But so you give me a chance to do two things and then wrap. One is to reinforce the point. But, and this is the bit that a lot of people on the left hate about my book, which is that I think, by and large, you want a pretty free labor market. You want employers and private institutions to be able to hire and fire and get the best people for their job. And you don't want to interfere too much in that. Because by and large, the meritocratic principle <coughs> in the market has been pretty good for equality. It's been pretty good for women and pretty good for people of color. I'm not saying we're there yet, but the whole idea that it should be the best person for the job has been powerfully equalizing across lines of race and gender. So I do not want to give up on that idea. The problem is the preparation for the market competition is so deeply unequal that the race is almost over before it's begun. By the time the kids of the upper class hit the labor market, they're so far ahead that of course they're going to succeed. It's not the market's fault. The market's rewarding them for having the skills that the market's supposed to reward them for. It's our entire system of education and human capital formation in the first 25 years of life. And so all of my proposals are aimed at those first 25 years to try and do something to equalize the preparation for the contest rather than changing the nature of the contest. And along the way, can we stop rigging it through things like legacy preferences, exclusionary zoning, handing out internships, etc. Right. So first of all, let's have a fair contest by getting rid of the hoarding, and then let's try and prepare ourselves more equally for that contest. That's kind of the argument that I'm, that I'm uh, trying to make. As for what we do about it and the solutions, and you know, should we do anything different? Should we not be doing the best for our kids? Look, I put up the slides about parenting and family structure, and look, I'm a father. I'm investing very heavily in my kids. I'm trying to create a great stable home for them, a good learning environment, I've got them in schools, I've mentioned my wife in there with the counselors and doing all of that. Being a dream hoarder is not the same thing as being a good parent, quite the opposite, we want more people to be good parents. The question is, where's the line? The line being the point at which being a good parent becomes acting in a way that is against our shared ideals of equal opportunity. There is a line, we might be drawing it in different places at different times, but like in the 19th century, the idea of legacy preference in the US, the idea of legacy preferences in college admissions was horrific. No one did. And when it was discussed, it was laughed out of court. Meanwhile, in the UK, it was standard practice. In the early 20th century, US institutions introduced legacy preferences to keep the Jews out of Ivy League colleges quite effectively, actually, for a few years. That was the motivation. Let's be clear about it. It was a racist policy. I'm not saying that's why they're doing it now, but that's where it came from. And so the US introduced it, and now legacy preferences are the norm. No problem. In, meanwhile, in the UK, legacy preferences came to be seen to be this horrific social norm that was privileging the already privileged. Right? So my point there is simply that norms change and that there are lines. If you um, 
take, I'll use this example in the book and I'll finish with this. If you think of a father, I'll use the, the stereotypical gender for this. Imagine a dad whose kid wants to get on the school baseball team. And so the dad comes home after work every day and practices with them, throwing, pitching and catching. Oops. I've got the yeah, passport, yeah. but okay, thanks. thanks. <laughs> uh, and the, and the, the same the boy as well, right? Let's make, it, let's make it easy, boy, right? The boy gets really good at it and goes to the tryouts and gets on the team. Hands up who thinks that was a good father. Okay. Father down the street doesn't have time to practice with his son, but has money and bribes the coach to get his son on the team, even though he wasn't really quite good enough. He was nearly good enough, but not quite good enough, but not otherwise he got. Hands up who thinks that's a good father. Why not? No law was broken. It's a private team. It was a gift and a bribe. The law was broken. The father gave something up in both cases. In the first case, he gave up his time. In the second case, he gave up his money. Perhaps an equivalent might be giving a donation to your college and thereby helping your kid to get in as opposed to helping your kid with their chemistry homework so they get smart enough to get in. And so there's a line. And the line appears to be something around parental behaviour that contributes to your kids getting stronger and better and so on, but which doesn't involve the use of institutional practices or economic power that rig the market in favour of them against others. So, yes, get your kids smart enough or they get into a great college, but don't bribe their way in and don't use legacy preferences. Yes, have internships in your institution, but make sure they're well paid and don't give them out to people who you happen to know on your kind of great bike, etc. And those are both individual decisions that we have to make, and I've had to make some very hard ones myself around some of those issues, which we all do. All I'm, all I'm inviting us to do is to recognise that there is a line, and that morality which just says, anything that's not actually illegal and is good for my kids is morally justified, has taken individualism to a level that will be destructive of the social fabric in a way that I think we're only just beginning to see. There is a line. <coughs> there are collective goods as well as individual goods. And sometimes that means my kid will do a little bit less well at the margins than they would otherwise have done because I'm not willing to, to, to play that card for them because it's unfair. But if I'm not willing to accept even that slight sacrifice, let's stop kidding ourselves about equality of opportunity and meritocracy and just accept the fact that we're in a Hobbesian war of all against all and may the richest and strongest win and stop complaining about inequality and lack of mobility and stop using phrases like the American dream. Either we have to make the American dream more real or we have to shut up about it. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> that was a more negative note to finish on than I intended. <laughs> Go the American dream. Thank you very much. Good advice. Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> and actually, yes. my, my phone was really good.